Can you take us through what social media content algorithms have done? Uh, sure, yeah. So the social media content algorithms, right, they decide what you read and what you watch. And they do that for literally billions of people for hours every day, right? Um, so in that sense, they have more control over human cognitive input than any dictator in history has ever had. More than Stalin, more than Kim Il-sung, um, more than Hitler, right? They have massive uh, power over human beings. Uh, and they're completely unregulated. And people are reasonably concerned about what effect they're having. Um, and so what they do um, is basically they, they set an objective because they're good standard model machine learning algorithms. And the, so they set an objective, let's say maximize click through, right? The, the probability that you're going to click on the next thing. So I'll imagine it's like this is YouTube. Uh, you know, you watch a video and lo and behold, another video pops up. Right. And am I going to watch the next video that it sends me to watch or am I going to, you know, close the window? Um, and so click through or, you know, engagement or various other metrics. These are the things that the algorithm is trying to optimize. And I suspect originally the, the companies thought, well, this is good because, you know, it's good for us. If they click on things, we make money. Uh, and it's good for people because the algorithm will learn to send people stuff they're interested in. If they click on it, it's because they wanted to click on it. Yeah, right. And there's no point sending them stuff that they don't like. It's just cluttering up their, their input, so to speak. Um, but, you know, I think the algorithms had other ideas. And uh, the way um, that an algorithm maximizes click-through in the long run is not just by learning what you want, right? Because you are not a fixed thing. And so the, you can get more long run click throughs if you change the person into someone who's more predictable, right? Who's, uh, for example, you know, addicted to a certain kind of violent pornography Right. And so YouTube can make you into that person by, you know, gradually sending you, you know, the, you know, the gateway drugs and then more and more uh, extreme content, whatever direction. So the algorithm doesn't know that you're a human being or you have a brain. Right. As far as it's concerned, you're just a string of clicks. Right. Content, click, content, click, content, click. Right. And um, but it wants to turn you into a string of clicks that in the long run, there's more clicks and less uh, less non-clicks. And so it learns to change people into more extreme, more, more predictable mainly, but it turns out probably more extreme versions of themselves. So if you, know, if, if you indicate that you're interested in climate science, it might try to turn you into an eco-terrorist, you know, and, you know, articles full of outrage and um, and so on. If if you're interested in in cars, it might try to you know, turn you into uh, someone who just watches endless and uh, en endless reruns of Top Gear. Or... Why is the person that's extreme more predictable? Well, I, I, this, I think this is a this is that's a, an empirical hypothesis on on my part, right? That um, if you're more extreme, you you have a higher emotional response uh, to content that affirms your uh, your current views of the world. And so, the, what in politics we call it red meat, right? The um, the kind of content that gets the base riled up about you know whatever it is they're riled up about, whether it's the environment or or you know immigrants flooding our shores or whatever it might be, right? You know, if once you once you get the sense that someone might be a little bit upset about too many immigrants, then you you send them stuff about all the bad things that immigrants do and, you know, you know, 
videos of people climbing over walls and uh, sneaking into beaches and, and all the rest of the stuff, you know, and, and it's, it, human propagandists have known this forever, but historically human propagandists could only produce one message. Whereas the content algorithms can produce in theory, one propaganda stream for each human being, specially tailored to them. And the algorithm knows how you engage with every single piece of content, right? Your typical, you know, Hitler's propagandist sitting in Berlin had absolutely no idea on a moment to moment basis how people were reacting uh, to the stuff that they were broadcasting, right? They could see it in the aggregate over longer periods of time um, that certain certain kinds of content was effective uh, in the aggregate, but they don't have anything like the degree of control that uh, that these algorithms have. And you know the one of the strange things is that we actually have very little insight into what the algorithms are actually doing. So what I've described to you seems to be a a logical consequence of how the algorithms operate and what they're trying to maximize. Um, but I don't have hard empirical evidence that this is really what's happening to people um, because the the platforms are pretty opaque. But they're, even, op- they're opaque to themselves. They're opaque to themselves. So, you know, Facebook's over, own oversight board doesn't have access to the algorithms and the data uh, to see what's going on. Who does? I think um, the engineers, but their job is to maximize click through, right? Uh, So pretty much there isn't anyone who doesn't already have a vested interest in this, who has access to what's happening. And and that I think is something that we're trying to fix um, both at the government level so there's, uh, there's this new organization called um, the Global Partnership on AI, which is, um, you know, it, it could just be, you know, yet another do-goody talking shop, but it actually has government representatives sitting on it. So it can make po- direct policy recommendations to governments. Um, and it ha- in some sense, it has the force of governments behind it when it's talking to the Facebooks and Googles of the world. Um, So we're in the process of seeing if we can develop agreements between governments and the platforms uh, for a certain type of transparency. So it doesn't mean, you know, looking at whatever, you know, looking at what Chris is is watching on YouTube. You do not want to do that. You you do not want to do that at all. (laughs) It uh, it means, um, you know, being able to find out you know, how much terrorist content uh, is is being pumped out, where is it coming from, who is it going to. Um, Slightly more sort of aggregated stuff like typical data yeah. scientists do. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and possibly being able to do some kinds of experiments, like you know, if, if the recommendation algorithm works this way, you know, what effects do we see on users compared to an algorithm that works in a different way? So the, to me, that's the the really interesting question um, is, you know, how do the recommendation algorithms work and what effect do they have on people? Um, and if we find that they really are manipulating people, right, that they're, they're sort of a consistent drift um, that a person who starts in a particular place will get driven in some direction that they might not have wanted to be driven in, um, then that's really a problem and we have to think about different algorithms. And so in in AI, we often distinguish between reinforcement learning algorithms, which um, are trying to maximize a long-term sum of rewards. So so in this case, the long-term rate of clicks uh, on the content stream is what the algorithm is trying to maximize. Those kinds of algorithms, by definition, will manipulate because the 
the action that they can take is to choose a particular piece of content to send you. And then the state of the world that they are trying to change is your brain. And so they, they will learn to do it, right? A supervised learning algorithm is one that's trying to get it right right now, right? So they are trying to um, predict whether or not you're going to click on a given piece of content, right? So a supervised learning algorithm that learns a good model of what you will and won't click on could be used to decide what to send you in a way that's not based on reinforcement learning and long-term maximization, but simply, okay, given a model of what you're likely to click on, we'll send you something that's consistent with that model, right? In that case, I think you could you could imagine that it would work in such a way that it wouldn't move you, it wouldn't cause you to change your preferences. But um, if it was done right, it could sort of leave you roughly where you are. Um, are you familiar with the term audience capture? Do you know what this means from a creator, an online creator's perspective? I uh, I can imagine, but not as not as a technical term. But yeah, well, it's so, not it's not a technical term, but it's okay. basically when you have a, a particular creator online who finds a message, narrative, rhetoric that resonates with the audience, and what you see is that this particular creator becomes captured, and they start to feed their own audience a message that they know is going to be increasingly more well liked. And for the most part, this actually does look like a slide toward one side of the one particular direction or the other, at least politically it does, but with anything it does too, that people inevitably sort of niche down and then they bring their audience along with it. So the fascinating thing here, I mean, first off, it's unbelievable that these algorithms that are simply there to try and maximize time on site or click throughs or watch time or whatever, that they have managed to find a way, things that we programmed managed to find a way to program us for it to be able to do its job better. I mean, that, when I read that in your book, I, it's insane. Like, that's one of the most terrifying things. That, and it's happening, right? it's happened. Like, everybody that's listening to this has had something occur with regards to their preferences, their worldview, whatever it might be. Something has slid in one way or another. You may be right. It may not be toward the extremes. I would say anecdotally, based on what I see in the world, increasing sort of um, levels of partisanship, no matter what it is, whether it be sports, politics, race relations, yeah. anything, uh, people are moving toward the extremes. Why is this happening? Oh, well, you know, it's people getting into echo chambers and they're only being shown stuff like that. And also the fact that the algorithms are actually trying to make them more predictable. But on top of that as well, there's another layer which is the creation of the content itself that yeah. comes in from the creators. And they have their own levels of manipulation, which has occurred from their feed. Then they kind of second order that into what do I want to create? What have I seen that's successful? What does my audience seem to resonate with from me? So you have layers and layers of manipulation going on here. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I, you know, in some ways the creators are, are being manipulated by the system. Um, you know, I think every journalist now is thinking, okay, I have to get something that's clickbait. I have to write an article that can have a headline that is sufficiently attractive that it'll get clicked on. You know, and it's almost the point where the, you know, the headline and the article are completely divorced from each other. Um, and, and, and you can see this now in the comments, right? The, the, People writing the comments at the end of the article will say, "Oh, I'm really, I'm really pissed off. This is just clickbait. You know, the article really doesn't say anything about the thing you said you were going to say, so on." So, so the, this, and it was not as if this has never been going on. And obviously, you can't, you can't ban people from writing interesting articles. Or, you know, I often think about, you know, the novel, and it says on the back, "I couldn't put it down." Right? Well, should we ban novels? That, you know, because like, oh, that's addictive. You know, you can't have that, right? Uh, no, but I think it wasn't too bad before because the feedback loop was very slow. 
And there wasn't this, you know, it, targeting of individuals by algorithms who are, you know, so you think about the, the number of learning opportunities for the algorithm, right? I mean, it's billions every day for the YouTube uh, selection algorithm, right? So it's the, the amount, the consistency, the frequency and the customization of the learning opportunities for manipulation so much greater. I mean, it's, it's you know millions of, or billions of times greater and more systematic. And that that systematic element. So it reminds me there's this. I don't know if it's apocryphal, but there's a um, there's a story about the psychology lecturer, and you know, he's been teaching the students about subliminal uh, effects. And the, you know, the students decide to play a trick on him, which is, you know, every, every time he's on the left-hand side of the room, they pay attention, they're really interested. And every time he walks onto the right-hand side of the room, they all really bored, you know, start checking out the email and so on. And, uh, and by the end of the lecture, he's glued against the left hand, <laughs> right? And he has no idea that he's being manipulated. Um, but because of the fact that this was like systematic and, uh, you know, and, and sufficiently frequent, it has a very, very strong effect. Uh, you know, and I think that that's the difference here is that it's because it's algorithmic, um, and it's tied into this very high frequency interaction, uh, that people have with social media. It, it has a huge effect. Um, and it has, a, I think, a pretty rapid effect as well. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy indeed. Peace. <laughs>